Good afternoon, dear friends. I am Dr. Munish Bharadwaj from the School of Engineering and Technology. Uh, topic of today's presentation is design of singly reinforced flanged beams. If you remember, till now we have discussed the design of singly reinforced and doubly reinforced rectangular beams. Uh, rectangular beams you have in your picture that it is in rectangular shape but now we are moving to another type of beam which is flanged beams how it is different from the rectangular beams that we will see here and what is the need or the circumstances when you come across such type of beams first of all if you uh, just remember that in rectangular beams where you will find such type of beams will be that either singly or doubly reinforced these rectangular beams will will be in isolation that we covered up to this point of time now why we move to another type of this uh, beam from rectangular to the flange beam that in practice you will find that the beams and the slabs are cast monolithically means when the material construction material of the beam and slab is same in that case the beam and the slab will be cast simultaneously and monolithically whereas the rectangular beams will you will come across uh, in practice only when generally when the material of the beam and the slab are different means in that case what you will do you will first cast the beam then you will lay or create the slab with the help of the other material so in that case only you will find such type of beams that is a rectangular beams otherwise generally in practice what you will find that the beams either behaving uh, in in the form of T beam or L beam these T the beams which are in shape of uh, English letter T or L these are called flange beams because these are having in addition to the web these are ha having flanges on either side of the web as you see ca as you can see in this slide this is continuous slab different beams are there here this intermediate beam this is in the shape of a letter English T so we call it as T beam whereas the end beams either this or this these are in shape of the inverted L letter of uh, English letter L so these we call as the L beams so bo whereas both of these collectively we call as flanged beams so what happens where uh, you will find these in the practice that whenever you are going to cast the such type of beams uh, simultaneously monolithically then what happens that shear stirrups of the beam extends into the slab and beam and the slabs are cast simultaneously in that in such situations uh, when you load the beam then some portion of the slab will act together with the beam to take the load and that way that some portion of the slab will be taken as for design and analysis purpose will be taken as the part of the beam so as shown here this this part of the slab is acting along with this beam so this part of the slab becomes the part of the beam and that way this becomes a T beam and in such cases the slab and the beam deform together and that certain portion of the slab on either side of the beam if available in end case in case of the end beam uh, that uh, portion of the slab will be available on one side of the beam only uh, whereas if the beam is intermediate beam then portion of the slab will be available on both side of the beam so in that case this uh, beam and the slab bands in unison means both bands in similar fashion taking the movement taking capacity of the beam increased 
So in that case, what is the advantage over the rectangular beams? The advantage is that these type of beams can take more load and their movement taking movement care taking capacity is high in comparison to the rectangular beams. So this is the advantage and these are the situations when you will find these beams in practice. Now, first of all, uh, how much portion of the slab will act along with the beam? That we have to decide. So that we call as effective width of flange. Here this that how much portion of the slab will act along with the beam that will depend upon certain factors such as span of the beam, width of the beam, width of the slab on adjacent sides, thickness of the slab. So these are some factors which decides that how much portion of the slab will act along with the beam when the beam will be loaded. Then code specifies that how to calculate this effective width of the flange of the beam. Code says that for T beams, this effective width of the flange BF will be taken as L0 by 6 plus BW plus 6 times DF, where this L0 is distance between sections of zero movements in a beam. This BW is breadth of the web and df is the thickness of the slab this is for t beam for l beam code says that this effective width of the flange beam bf will be taken as l0 by 12 plus bw plus 3 times tf so these are the formulae which will be used to calculate the effective width of the beam in case of t beam and l beam these are specified in the code IS-456. Now these are for when we, uh, more than one beams are used. If a beam is provided in the floor or the roof system in isolation, means single beam is provided, then in that case this effective width of the flange is little bit different from the earlier case and in that case we define for T beam this BF breadth of the flange we calculate as L0 divided by L0 by B plus 4 plus BW and for L beams we calculate BF as 0.5 L0 L0 divided by B plus 4 plus BW. So these are the formulae specified by the code to calculate the effective width of the flange. So till now we have decided that how much portion of the slab will act along with the beam when the beam will be loaded. So that part of the slab which will be the now behave as a part of the beam for the analysis and design purpose here. Now there is uh, one uh, condition is there that when you will call it as a monolithic or when you will uh, say that uh, this uh, behavior is monolithic of the beam and the slab. The condition is that if the main reinforcement of a slab is parallel to beam, the transverse reinforcement of the slab at the junction shall not be less than 60% of the main reinforcement. So this is the condition. At mid span of the slab, extending into it up to at least quarter span of the beam to have the monolithic behavior. So monolithic behavior we will say that the behavior is monolithic only when that the transverse reinforcement of the slab at the junction is not less than 60 percent and also that it extends up to at least quarter of the span means L by 4 on both sides on both sides of the beam. <coughs> so this is a condition to define that the behavior of the beam and the slab will be monolithic. Now let's come to the analysis and design part of the flanged beams. So when you go for the analysis and design of the flanged beams, you will across with two type of problems. First is to determine moment of resistance MU for given cross section of a flanged beam. Means you will be given a cross section of the beam 
and you will be asked to calculate or determine the moment of resistance MU. Second type of problem is to design the T beam. So for second type of problem the known thing will be generally the architectural drawings. You, you are provided with the architectural drawings and from there you will decide that what is the span, what is uh, uh, then uh, based on that uh, uh, information you will go for the design of the beam that what should be the depth, what should be the reinforcement, what should be the dimensions of the beam that you will decide looking into the architectural drawings that you will be provided with for design of the T section. So these are the two type of problems that you will come across in the analysis and design of the flanged beams. So let's take one by one. First case that to determine the moment of resistance when the cross section of the flange beam is given. So as you know in analysis and design our first step is to calculate the depth of the neutral axis XU. So here also we will proceed in the same way we have to first calculate the depth of the neutral axis. So here first of all we assume that uh, as, you, as, you, uh, as you know that there are two portions here flange and the web in the uh, in this uh, flange beams. So first first of all we assume that our depth of neutral axis is less than the depth of the flange. Means neutral axis lies within the flange only. Then as it is seen here this is DF is the depth of the flange. This XU is the depth of the neutral axis and you can see this XU lies within the flange. <coughs> so here what we will do we will equate the forces compressive force and the tensile force for from the law of the equilibrium. So here you can write C equal to T means compressive force equal to the tensile force. From your uh, earlier knowledge of the uh, analysis and design this C is compressive force is 0.36 FCK XU into BF here we are taking this flange bay width that will be equal to 0.87 FY AST so when the, our neutral axis lies within the flange we are starting with this assumption then what happens that the portion below this neutral axis this is under tension and we know that in case of that uh, tensile region our concrete has no role to play only that steel will take the forces here in such a case. So here we neglect that uh, Porsche concrete portion below the neutral axis here then this simply becomes uh, just like uh, this uh, rectangular beam and from that uh, knowledge we can write this total compressive force as 0.36 FCK XU equal to BF and for the steel portion means the tensile uh, forces will be 0.87 FY AST. So from here you will calculate the depth of the neutral axis XU. So, so if uh, uh, you see at this expression this is same as that we obtained in case of the uh, rectangular beam of the cross section uh, BF into D means if you extend this if you extend this the, uh, these lines then the t t this uh, dimension or the cross section of the beam will be BF into D and for such a rectangular beam this uh, this is same as for a rectangular beam. Now after calculating this depth of neutral axis let us see whether this is true to our assumption or not. If the value of XU obtained from this equation is more than DF then the new value of XU will be calculated. If this if XU is less than DF then it's fine this the problem reduces to simply rectangular beam but it will not be there because uh, we are um, uh, going to analyze and design the this 
flanged beam. So, in most of the cases, we will find that this XU is coming out to be more than DF. Now, if this is the situation, then we have to find the new value of XU because this value of XU was based on the assumption that XU is less than DF. So, we have to find the new value of XU. Now, there will be two cases. First case, if XU is greater than DF, then we have to see <coughs> whether this 3 seventh of the XU is less than DF or greater than DF. Now, where from this number 3 by 7 is coming from? If you remember from the, your knowledge of the rectangular beam design, there we find that this portion, this portion of uh, our stress block up to which this variation is a straight line, that was uh, 0.42 XU, uh, sorry 0.43 XU and uh, if, you if you solve this 3 by 7, this is almost equal to 0.43. So, this point Three, this 3 by 7 value is representing that 0.43 value. So, you can simply write here 0.43 also, but for sim uh, simplification, we are writing 3 by 7 of XU. So, here by writing this 3 by 7 XU or comparing this 3 by 7 XU value with, with DF means we are comparing that the depth of this stress block up to which the variation is linear means this is a rectangular portion of this uh, stress block that up to up to what portion we are comparing this uh, straight line variation of the stress block with the depth of the flange that up to which portion of the flange this variation is linear or straight line uh, in rest of the portion as you know this is parabolic so, uh, here we are comparing this that whether this 3 by 7 or 0.43 XU is less than DF. If it is so, then it means that rectangular come parabolic portion of the stress block is acting on the flange. Means some of some portion, means whole of the portion of the rectangular block will be within the flange and some of the parabolic portion also will be there within the flange, will be acting on the flange. So, this is the meaning of this comparison here 3 by 7 XU with the DF. So, in this situation as you see here depth of neutral axis is more than DF and 3 by 7 XU is less than DF then in that case what we do we equate the total compressive force and the total tensile force. Here you see that this uh, total compressive force has two components. We can divide this total compressive force into two components. One is coming from the web portion and one another from the flange portion. So, this is uh, uh, this the, the uh, linear or the hot, uh, rectangular stress block. This we are taking here and this portion of the compressive force which is coming from this web, this you can write from your knowledge of your rectangular beam only 0.36 FCK XU into BW. So, up to this portion, up to this portion because we are considering the whole stress, stress block here and uh, this XU is greater than DF. So, for this blue portion, shown here in this uh, picture. For this blue portion, you can write that this will be the total compressive force which is coming out from the, which is the um, contribution of the web. Now, this now remains the portion of the flange. Now, for writing the uh, contribution of compressive force from the flange, we consider this and one factor yf and we are taking because bw we have taken earlier this width we have taken earlier so the width remaining with us is now bf minus bw this portion and this portion 
So for these two portions, we will be writing the total compressive force and for that portion, for ease of our calculation, what we assume, we assume a depth yf which is shown here, which is which will be something from this portion, outermost fiber to up to this thing and this yf is defined as that equivalent depth of the flange on which a uniform stress of 0.45 FCK will be supposed to be acting. Why we are assuming? Because if you look at this stress block, up to this portion, this is a straight line. After that, that this is uh, becoming a parabola. So this, in this depth of the flange DF, there, is, there are two portions, a straight line and the parabola. So this calculation will be a little bit difficult here. So we make an assumption that not up to the whole DF, up to certain depth of YF of the flange, this variation will be a straight line. And, and that portion we are defining as YF. And this straight line means this stress level there will be 0.45 FCK. So assuming that 0.45 FCK is a uniform stress acting up to a depth of YF, we can easily calculate the contribution of the flange to this compressive force. So 0.45 FCK into YF into this width BF minus BW because contribution of BW we have taken earlier in this portion. So for BF minus BW we will be considering here. So this is the contribution of the con to the compressive force given by the flange. This is the contribution of the web to the total compressive force. So these two total compressive forces we are adding now and now we are e equating it to the tensile forces that will be borne by the our reinforcement here. So this is 0.87 FYAST. So from here you can calculate the XU, new XU. Now, but this, is, this was one case. But if however the value of XU obtained is such that 3 by 7 XU is greater than DF. Earlier, just now we assumed that 3 by 7 XU is less than DF. Now we are taking the another case when this 3 by 7 XU is greater than DF. Means our rectangular portion or straight line portion of the stress block is beyond the depth of the flange. Then we have to calculate again the new value of depth of neutral axis XU. And which you can calculate here. This time this uh, calculation becomes easy because now this if you look at here this 3 by 7 was up to 3 by 7 XU was up to this portion only means the whole of the depth of the flange was not covered by the straight line variation of the stress block. Now in this case if 3 by 7 XU is greater than DF then this straight line variation will be beyond this DF. So here the life becomes easy. Here you can calculate the total compressive force as this uh, contribution from the web as you as we did earlier and here is there is no need of calculating the YF because now that uh, straight line variation is beyond DF so up to DF we can simply take the stress level as 0.45 FCK so with this stress level you can calculate the compressive force coming out from the flange so 0.45 FCK DF into B minus BW, this is the contribution of the flange here. This is contribution of the web for the compressive force. And now adding these two, the you will get the total compressive force. And you will find now the, you will equate it to the tensile force 0.87 FY into AST. That is, come, that is the contribution from the reinforcement. Now, so these are the uh, uh, two cases for the calculation of the depth of neutral axis. So depending upon the value of depth of neutral axis 
and its magnitude with respect to the depth of the flange. The moment of resistance may be calculated for various cases generally that we uh, encounter with three cases. First is under reinforced, second is balanced and third is over reinforced section. So for these three type of sections we will calculate the moment of resistance keeping in view the depth of neutral axis and its comparison with the depth of the flange. So we will categorize our problem into two types. Type 1 problem when xu is less than or equal to df. So since such situation is very easy as I told you when the depth of neutral axis lies within the flange or equal to the depth of the flange then in that case the lower portion or the web portion whole of the web portion of the beam will be under tension and as you know we we do not consider the portion of the concrete which is under the tensile forces so in that case we can safely assume that this is this the, this uh, beam will act as a rectangular beam so in such case in this type of problem where you will find that depth of neutral axis is less than or equal to the depth of the flange in that case you can simply go for a design of a rectangular beam now let's see the type 2 problem type 2 problem is when the depth of neutral axis is greater than the depth of the flange here if that situation occurs then there will be two cases case one that depth of neutral axis is less than the limiting depth of neutral axis means what is the meaning of it if the depth of neutral axis is less than the limiting depth of neutral axis then as you know we call such type of situation as under reinforced beam second type of problem will be case 2 will be that the depth of neutral axis is greater than or equal to limiting value there if this is equal then the case will be a balance section if the depth of neutral axis is greater than the limiting depth of neutral axis then that case we will call as the over reinforced and whenever we come across to the over reinforced section we redesign we revise the design and we never accept the over reinforced design so either our design has to be under reinforced or balance so section should be under reinforced or balance if by some acc accidentally or uh, by mistake if we have designed a over reinforced section then we have to redesign it so let's take the first case first case is that our depth of neutral axis is greater than the depth of the flange and this this depth of neutral axis is less than the maximum or the limiting depth of the neutral axis so here means this is, it is a case of the under reinforced section so this value of the moment of resistance can be obtained with the help of the two different equations depending upon whether this 3 by 7 xu is less than or greater than or equal to the depth of the flange as I told you earlier. So case 1 we take as depth of neutral is axis is greater than depth of the flange means the section is under reinforced xu is less than xu max but the second situation is that 3 by 7 of xu is greater than or equal to df in this case what we do that from similarity of triangles in a strain diagram the rectangular portion of the stress block will extend at least up to the full depth of the flange therefore the CG of the compression force in the flange will be 
at df by 2 from the top of the flange giving the lever arm as d minus df by 2. With lever arm as you know we calculate by subtracting the depth of the CG of the compressive force from the effective depth of the beam. So lever arm you will get here in this case as d minus df by 2 and this lever arm is very important for us to calculate the movement of resistance because if you know the total compressive force or the total tensile force so just simply multiply it by the lever arm you will get the movement of resistance. So for this case the movement of resistance of the section can be calculated in two steps the movement of resistance of the rectangular portion of the beam of the depth D means we are considering the web portion and second is movement of resistance of the flange portion of the beam. So this beam we can consider as if made of the two beams means we are taking the full portion of the web separately and the remaining portion of the flange separately and after calculating for these two type of the beams we will add up then we will get the final movement of resistance or the total movement of resistance. So you can see the contribution to this movement of resistance from the web taken, taken as a rectangular portion of up to the depth of D, effective depth D. So this you can write as 0.36 xu by D into 1 minus 0.42 xu by D into fck bw into d square as you learned in case of the rectangular beam case. And for the flange portion you can write 0.45 fck bf minus bw because now this is the remaining portion of the flange. BW we have considered already in this case, in this first case. So now the effective width of the flange remaining here we, it is BF minus BW into DF into D minus DF by 2. So this is the our lever arm. So that way this becomes the total movement of resistance for the of the beam. For the case when xu is greater than df and 3 by 7 xu value was greater than df. Now second case is when xu is greater than df means the section is, is still under reinforced. xu is uh, 3 by 7 of xu value is less than df. So here from the similarity of triangles in strain diagram 3 by 7 of xu less than df means that the rectangular come parabolic portion of the stress block will cover the full depth hence an equivalent depth of the flange yf which is greater than or less than or equal to df is stipulated to make analysis simple as i told you earlier that in, in this case we have to find a fictitious value yf uh, for which we can simply consider the stress uniform as 0.45 fck. So using this value of yf we can write here this uh, m uh, moment of resistance uh, coming from the web portion this is same as in earlier case but here this is different from uh, the first case that we are taking here as 0.45 fck bf minus bw into yf this is the factor for which we are considering that this stress level is 0.45 fck uniform throughout this depth yf and this now will be the lever arm d minus yf by 2 because cg will be considered at the middle or the mid at the midpoint or the mid height of the stress block so that way we can calculate the moment of resistance for this case. Now we come to the second case. In case 1 we considered the under reinforced section. Now here we will consider 
the balance or the over reinforced section balance uh, case means xu is equal to the df and over reinforced case means xu is greater than xu max here also we will be considering two different equations for mu depending upon whether this 3 by 7 xu value is greater than equal to or less than df and also whether the flange is thin or thick with respect to the depth of the beam so these considerations we will again keep in mind as we did for the case 1 so here for the case 2 first case case 2a we will take as xu is greater than df balanced or over reinforced section depending upon uh, that uh, xu is uh, equal to xu max or xu is great, uh, greater than xu max uh, but the first case is that 3 by 7 xu value is greater than or equal to df means the flange is thin with respect to the depth of the beam means df by d is less than 0.2 here we consider another factor we consider the depth of the flange and the depth of the beam so we define that the flange is thin if df by d ratio is less than 0.2 now if we consider that beam is balanced or over reinforced section as the case is here the value of the mu will be always limited to mu limited case, limiting case because as I told you the moment of resistance cannot be more than the balanced section because we don't go for the over reinforced designs so the maximum bending moment that can be considered is the limiting moment means the moment for a balance section and xu will be taken as xu max in such such a case again here 3 by 7 xu is greater than or equal to df the depth of the rectangular portion of the stress block will be at least equal to the df so here we can write that moment of resistance we will, will be the two moment of resistance uh, that is coming from the web another from the flange portion and here you can write that 0.36 xu max in place of xu mind it that we here we are writing xu max because we are casing we are taking the limiting case whether it is a balance section or over reinforced section for in both for both type of cases movement cannot be more than the mu limiting and for that xu is replaced here by xu max otherwise that expression is same for the last case now let's take the second case in this category xu is greater than df valence or over reinforced section and 3 by 7 xu is greater than or equal to df and now here we are considering that flange is thick means the df by d ratio is less than 0.2 here for this case what we do that again xu is limiting uh, xu is uh, limited to the maximum depth of neutral axis means xu is equal to xu limiting and moment of resistance mu will be taken as mu max or the mu limiting here the equivalent depth of the flange yf we will take as 0.15 xu plus 0.65 into df and which is less than df will be taken for the analysis here and as you know what is this yf yf is the fictitious portion or the depth of the flange up to which you consider that stress level is uniform and its value is 0.45 fck so here you can write this mu will be equal to mu limiting which is equal to this plus sign is not there this is equal to sign should be there so equal to mu w plus mu f which you can write as 0.36 xu max divided by d into 1 minus 0.42 xu max by d into fck 
BW d square plus 0.45 FCK BF minus BW into YF and this is lever arm D minus YF by 2 is the lever arm. So that way we get the movement of resistance for this particular case. Now so this the, these were the these were the cases for the first type of problem when the section is given and you are asked to calculate the movement of resistance. Uh, another type of problem is to design the section flanged beam T section. So in this case first there are various steps because you are provided with uh, the architectural drawings only and uh, you have to some information you have to assume based on some thumb rules and some of the information you have to take from the code IS456. So with the help of these two things thumb rules experience and the 456 code you will start the getting some initial values for this because in such type of uh, problems oh, you are known or you are given with only the architectural drawings means you can only get the information regarding the span of the beam and for, for rest of the things you have to depend on the thumb rules experience and the IS 456 codal provisions. So here uh, first problem is or the first step is to find the dead load and for calculating the dead load you know the density of the reinforced concrete. So if you know the density then another information that you uh, would like to know that will be the volume and volume means here the section. So for such type of problems you have to start with assuming or giving some initial values uh, based on some thumb rules or experience or the codal provisions you have to get some initial sections. You have to assume some initial sections. If you get the initial section means the width and the depth of the beam then you can calculate the area of the section and for a unit uh, length of the section you can calculate the volume and if you multiply this volume with the density of the reinforced concrete then you can get the dead load. So dead load that way you can calculate. Second thing live loads are generally given. So based on this information of the dead load and live load. Live load either it will be given in the architectural drawings th uh, that for what purpose the building is being constructed or being designed. So based on that information you can get the information of the live load. So having this information of the dead load and live load then you will proceed further and whatever values you will find for the for these values for the, this load values you will calculate the uh, bending movement coming to that section then you will find out the depth of the beam the width of the beam and you will check these things in the comparison to the assumed values initial assumed values this we will take in our next lecture so the whole design portion of the uh, this fl flanged beams we will take in the our next lecture so up to this point uh, you can you you can easily uh, now calculate the movement of resistance of a given section. In your uh, booklets of this ET508A uh, you, you will find some solved uh, problems there for this uh, calculation of the or the determination of movement of resistance. So you please go through those uh, problems and if you fa face any problem then we will discuss in our next lecture when we will go for the design of the T-beam and we will solve some of the uh, problems for the determination of the movement of resistance.
so thank you for uh, patience listening and i expect that in our next lecture there will be some interaction because today i did not hear from you any question or query i hope you will uh, come prepared in the next lecture and we will have a good interaction thank you